Good day, Danny. Thank you again for coming back to do another video interview with me. It's a pleasure, believe me. So we're going to focus this second video interview on uh, something that's known in some ISPI circles as the Tucson 7. Now, a little background for our audience. The, uh, the Tucson 7 included you, the late Gary Rumbler, the late Claude Lineberry, the late Don Toasty, Bob Carlton, who's still with us today, Dale Brethauer, and Roger Kaufman. So there's four of the, out of the seven who are here. Earlier, a couple weeks ago, I spoke with and recorded Roger Kaufman talking about the Tucson 7 and Dale Brethauer talking about the Tucson 7. So my interest in this and capturing the story and the results of this group, um, going back to, I think it was 2003, Roger Addison invited Tim Eskew and myself me becoming the president-elect and becoming then president of ISPI, he invited us to this meeting, Roger Anderson did. And uh, we, we came to this meeting, and it was the seven of you guys that later became known as the Tucson Seven. And it was a discussion about how, in my view, in my memory of all these years ago, was about... ISPI was not meeting the needs of its senior members. And there was, as the incoming president, I needed to be aware of this and see what I could do at the next conference to begin to address some of their needs. Um, the discussion was had, the meeting time uh, ran out. It was decided that everybody was going to get together and meet at Gary Rummler's place in Tucson, hence the name Tucson 7. And uh, I put it in my calendar, and I believe Tim Eskew put it in his calendar, and Roger Eskew put it in his calendar, and, and I think I even made flight arrangements or something. But a week later, Roger Edison called me up and said, I've been disinvited, Tim Eskew has been disinvited, and you've been disinvited to this meeting. They just want to meet by themselves and get together to discuss their issues. Uh, and then we will hear from them whatever comes out of that meeting. So I'm going to now turn this over to you because I may not have it quite right from your perspective, and you can uh, correct uh, my misunderstandings and, and misrecollections from that time so many years ago. But uh, start us off. What was this Tucson 7 group all about? Okay. Well, a little bit of history will help put the thing in context. And I think it has something to do with making sure that our intent maybe was not what people created it to be just from the outside. The actual idea of it started, I think, about three years before we actually formed. And it came about, I believe, through a discussion between myself and uh, Joe Harless. And Bill Detterline may have been involved in some way or another. And as you know, it was pretty common for people to gather in bars, and then that's where they had some of their more meaningful discussions. And I'm sure that the topic came up, and I think I probably initiated it. And it was this notion that uh, it would be nice to get together a small group that could go somewhere and discuss, uh, not ISPI, but uh, to discuss our particular ways of looking at the technology and, and our practice. So, uh, and it was in a sense designed as an intellectual discussion, intellectual group, I, I think, more than anything. And uh, so anyway, we, we sort of talked about this. And for the next two or three years, we'd get to the conference again, and I would ask Joe, I'd say, don't you think it's time we got this group together? And, and Joe would say sort of no. Uh, he was too busy doing this and that. And, uh, and I understood that because he, was, uh, he had this particular process he was selling to various people, including Boeing. And uh, so the topic would be dropped. And then 
one of those uh, times, it must have been around, as you say, around 2003, uh, I brought the topic up again, and uh, Claude Lineberry was there. And if you know enough about Cla Cla Claude Lineberry, Butch, uh, if you said something and he was interested, uh, he was like white on rice, <laughs> and he would just go for it. And he, oh, hell, we ought to do that. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. And so we discussed who that might be then. And it was, I thought it was an interesting discussion because it, it was pretty simple in one sense. Uh, it was to be f people who had a system, had a model, had a whatever you want to call it. And so having somebody like uh, Don Tosti was obvious. Gary Rumler was obvious. Uh, uh, Roger Kaufman was obvious. And uh, then as we talked to these various people, and I, and I think I was only obvious because I had uh, you know, been developing this language and work model. Uh, we added on a, a couple of others. Uh, and that would have been uh, Dale Breathauer because uh, of Gary's association with him and his feeling that uh, Dale, uh, being in the academic world that he was, represented a whole set of possibilities, okay? And so him along with Kaufman in that sense, an academic, although Kaufman was doing a lot of stuff outside, as was Dale. So. I think that got us up to six or so. And then uh, Claude wanted to add on uh, Bob, Bob Carlton. Carl. And, and that was because of a couple of things, I think, which made sense. Uh, one, they, they were associated together, and, and he and, and uh, Claude and uh, Don Tosti, you know, were doing all that British Airways stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of split apart. And uh, this was the preliminary thinking and action on the part of Claude and Bob Carlton, you know, around the due diligence stuff that they were doing. Okay? So if you think about it, these seven people were self selected <laughs> in yeah. a sense because they had. Uh, something they offer in the way of the methodology. And, and wouldn't it be nice if we got together and, uh, and talked about that? What we had, each our perceptions, and what would we learn from one another? Mm -hmm. So I don't think there was any sort of, at least from the outset, any nefarious intent to say, ISP is all screwed up, let's get together, we can talk together and then uh, see what comes out of that. It was really our self-interest, in both in our development and in what we were doing. So uh, before we ran off to, to do something like that, pretty sure that uh, somebody said, and probably Roger Kaufman, we had to let ISBI know. So they got a hold of Roger Addison, told him, and then he ended up telling you and telling, I guess, Tim Eskew, I, I didn't even remember too much about that other than there was that meeting. And, and what I do remember about it was that after there was this telling of what we were going to do, uh, the notion as to whether any of these other people ought to come in, it was more than unanimous that nobody else should come. Mm -hmm. You know, that we had selected these people for this reason. <clears throat> And there wasn't any need to be adding on this other part. There might be a need to add on somebody later, and then there there was a discussion about that, not at that meeting, but in after the about the second meeting. So, uh, as you have noted, uh, Gary uh, volunteered to have it at his place, uh, part because he didn't want to travel. I'm sure <laughs> he had the facility, which none of the rest of us said. I, I do remember an offering to have. Uh, people come to where I was because, you know, I had certain facilities I could make use of. But anyway, it was fine. We went to, to Arizona. And what happened at those meetings uh, 
was both useful and not useful. Uh, each of us was given the platform for a half a day, basically, mm -hmm. to talk about their system. And so they, each person would. And as they did, you could ask questions about it and then say how that relates to what you do or doesn't relate or adds on to it or something else. And that was therefore meeting that intent, you know, that purpose that we had in the, in the outset. Somebody then introduced the notion that having learned this thing here, let's say from Don Toasty, that that might be use, use, used over here on an ongoing project that Roger Kaufman was doing or something. Mm -hmm. And so they negotiated whether they were going to do it and, uh, and, and nothing more came out of that uh, because uh, we weren't there to promote one another's business really. We were there to talk about uh, what we had and, and what we might gain from one another. I'm not sure that the gain was substantial. Okay. It was incremental. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm sure you well know, as most people do, that these are pretty strong personalities. <laughs> to say the least, yes. To say the least. And one thing you know about a strong personality and people that have a vision of, of their model. Yeah. I think it's a little bit like, I, I believe it was Copernicus who had this problem <laughs> because I think he was saying, you know, the world is really round and people are going, you're nuts. Uh, that really uh, what, uh, if you are a model maker, let's just call them that, uh, you have to be your own best advocate. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what you have to do is listen to other people and what they have to offer. And uh, I think some of these people were quite capable of doing that and others weren't. Uh, I know for my own part, it was just fascinating for me to sit there, as always, to listen to Don Toasty. Because if he didn't have a great idea right there, he'd, he'd probably think up one right on the spot. Uh, the same was true of Roger Addison, uh, and excuse me, Kaufman to the extent that his was global, bigger, mm -hmm. and, you, and you're trying to figure out where do you fit into that and how might that perspective be useful you know, in, in what you're doing. So I've got to say that out of those discussions, if you got it, one or two, and hopefully three nuggets, you got your money's worth. Mm -hmm. And so when we were having those discussions, of course, Again, because of these strong personalities, ISPI would come up. You know, they're not doing this, or they're doing this, or whatever. For the most part, I just didn't give a damn about that. You know, I, I, I had been in ISPA for a long time then, and I had learned most of the stuff that I needed to learn, and, and what I liked about ISPI was to go and see if I'm going to learn something else from anybody doesn't make it's not necessarily one of these other six guys mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to go to a session and I was very careful about the session I went to because I wanted to see if they had something for me and obviously as the years went on there was less and less and less uh, and I think there are two reasons for that one is that uh, you you're just not a, as empty a vessel as you used to be. <laughs> so you're not going to, you know, learn a lot more. But also I think there was less because you have to remember that the origins of ISPI were steeped in people who were in large part kind of researchers of things. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that thing I talked about. They were they were scientists and they came out of a variety of stuff and and as opposed to where the society gradually went to because uh, out of necessity it started getting into certification 
which by the way is an interesting thing the certification and they grandfathered a number of people in mm -hmm. and I always thought it was a mystery why they didn't grandfather Dale Brathauer <laughs> who was you know, a prime example of somebody who had it already the you know the competency or myself as far as that goes so we didn't really care in one sense on the other hand we thought it was just a mystery why they would <laughs> do these things so there was that and then of course there was the rise of academic programs where you could get into the field mm -hmm. and automatically what that does unfortunately or fortunately is it gets a number of people in there shouldn't be there but it also gets a number of people in there that, that uh, from those programs are learning a great deal to go out and practice so I don't have any any issues about academic programs or certification or so on but you have to recognize at the same time they have their upside and they have their downside because people coming into ISP or NSPI really uh, or people who are coming uh, with very good intentions and were uh, had this sincere interest around developing this thing mm -hmm. this creature so uh, the, I think the Tucson 7 notion was viewed then <laughs> from the outside world as this elitist group of people going off to do something uh, and, and maybe rightfully so but on the other hand it really wasn't why we were doing it we were just intellectually curious to be able to get together and share information and that's precisely what we did and the fact that it, it ran out of gas uh, I, mean, I think you're right because Gary died uh, really didn't mean much because we had already achieved what we intended to achieve and to go on from there any further I don't know if it had produced that much I can also say that even though we may have been in those sessions at times and bitched about ISPI we always bitched about ISPI yeah. <laughs> whether we were there or some other place so we weren't there to do something nefarious you know and go off and form our own association or so on uh, we were there to intellectually satisfy one another mm -hmm. yeah that's part of my recollection from those days is that and I and I do appreciate your comments about meeting in the bar in, in the evenings I wrote down on my notes there because I was told at my first conference that we needed to go down to the bar in the evenings and sit there and shut up and listen because this will be the best sessions, the evenings in the bar, and the dialogue that would happen because you gurus would get together and you would talk and challenge each other and probe, and it was truthfully, and I, and I see this, I read this about other conferences, not ISPI, where those activities, the conversations in the hallway, et cetera, et cetera, are where there is so much value gained not just in the sessions and some people would say better than in the sessions but so that's that's true but you know it was really hard for me because i don't drink I mean, yeah <laughs> speak of, i mean i'll have a beer now and then. i'm not against people drinking i'm i don't drink because i i'm an alcoholic or something i, I just don't have the the alcohol gene mm -hmm. and so i'm having to go down into these bars and listen to these guys half <laughs> yeah, that's and really being assholes sometimes. Well, talking to other people or them or themselves, mm -hmm. and so it was. It was there was yeah, there was there was always a little bit about that. <laughs> so, but so so my takeaway was that okay, they wanted me to be there in that first meeting because we, you guys were meeting to share what each other was, what you were doing, how you were doing it, how it compared and contrasted to each other's stuff. Um, but the complaint that I got, and I remember Dale Brethar were telling me this back then, because I and I asked he and I asked Rumler, you know, so what's coming out of this? What you know, what should the society do? Should we have a special track for senior members by invitation only? Because one of the things that was a trigger um, in one of the conversations I had was that I know Gary and Don both did a session together, and someone came in and asked a seven minute question seven minute long question which was more about him than it was about them and th what they were presenting on and it annoyed a lot of people in the audience it was a standing room only overflow out into the hallway and 
they were kind of annoyed about those kinds of questions here when they really want to, so this is part of it, was that they wanted to, to be stimulated and to learn. And I remember as president, I asked, because the, the conference is the president's thing and they get to do make a lot of choices, whether or not I should have, a, not a track necessarily, a whole track through the whole conference, but a session or two, invitation only, and I remember even promising them before I had permission from a board to do this was that, you know, pick a speaker. We'll fly them in. We'll, we'll let them, you know, you can chat with them, you know, for however you, long you want or whatever. And then I was told at the end that, no, that wouldn't be necessary. So, so part of my interest in this has always been, what do we do for the senior members? And, and, you know, that was an issue decades ago and is certainly an issue today. But so I, I would like to use this opportunity to ask you for your thoughts about if you were to be going to the next ISPI conferences, what is it that, that can be done? What kind of forum would it be? Is it a speaker? Is it a get together? Is it another kind of a sharing, comparing, contrasting? Something that would serve the needs of somebody at your level and stature in the profession what 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 can a society do for folks like you well uh they do need to to provide a platform uh because we've <laughs> we've been around long enough to know what works and doesn't work and we've got ideas we've developed and we need a platform to talk about it so i can certainly put a presentation together and go through the process of, of getting that accepted and then decide whether I really want to do it or not after all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, I'll go back to, to Paul Tremper okay. days. Paul Tremper had a way of massaging people to make them feel valued. And that was particularly true of the leadership. He took care of them. So uh, the executive director of the society needs to understand that the, that the strength and the place from which the knowledge comes and so on is embedded in those people that have been around and stuck in there with them. And, and, uh, and, to, and to figure out who does it for altruistic purposes and does it for economic purposes and right, so on. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, to provide that platform, and it, and it has taken different forms uh, over the years, uh, and the most obvious of those, I remember back in my, my, my day as president, I put together a, uh, we called it, I think Judith Corkhorn, when I told her what I wanted to do, she, she called it the six pack or something. And, and what that I was gonna do is take three, six of the leading people and, and invite them mm -hmm. and say, you have an hour and a half or something to talk to virtually everybody, if not everybody, half of everybody, and talk about your ideas and uh, what you think needs to be. Talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. And uh, that kind of forum for people uh, both reinforces, provides incentive to them, and keeps them interested. If you don't do that, then you you're making them go through the standard process, which is okay. I don't know. Any, I don't know the sta I don't, that standard process. Gary Rumler got rejected when he made proposals oh, yeah. a, more than once, yeah. and and I got rejected. I understand. Yeah, and but but so Claude Linebury uh, was rejected. <laughs> this is a funny story. Uh, somewhere in the application, it asked a question, and he said. I think it's goddamn obvious, is his answer. And so he was rejected on that standpoint. And, uh, but so there was, so part of it, what I, what I hear you saying here is that the executive director and actually others in positions to make decisions, such as the conference proposal review committee people, they need to understand, um, you know, yeah, we need maybe a tight screen on people who have not proven themselves. But then there's another group of people in the society who have proven themselves. And if they want to come and speak on, you know, ghosts in the machine, then we ought to let them because it's probably going to be really good. And 
and we shouldn't make them jump through the same hoops. Um, in talking with Jim Hill, we did an, one of these interviews just a couple of days ago, last week, and he said, and I, and I said, I recall when you were conference when you were on the board with me, Dale Breathauer's board in 1999, you told the story about how as conference chair, you had to go in and look at all the rejections and approved proposals. And you reversed many on both sides because we didn't necessarily have the right people in place there to make those kinds of judgments. And it's not always obviously obvious in black and white in the proposal submission. Um, and uh, and so I think in one sense, we kind of dishonor uh, some of our valued uh, members, longtime contributors who have proven their worth and what they have to say. And we put them through the same thing that they might have done for my first presentation, you know, where I've only presented a chapter one time before, and now I'm coming in and want to present it national, which happened in 1985. And so I would expect a different screen for somebody who's newer, like I was then, than somebody who has presented numerous times and is recognized as a thought leader. Um, so we need to treat them differently, I think. But we also need to provide for them, as you say, the platform and allow them to come in and speak on almost whatever the heck they want. And because there's something valuable that will be learned, uh, you know, 90 ti- 99 times out of 100. Um, well, another version of that, by the way, is to, uh, as a board, whatever, decide in, in light of the conference uh, theme, decide who could we invite that's among our Mm-hmm. Own to come and talk about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that could be more valuable than virtually anything because if you ask a number of those people their opinion on a certain thing, they will sure as hell come up with something. And you might even <laughs> say to them, I want you to challenge us. Don't just come in and you know, mm-hmm. say some nice things. If you want to challenge us and tell us we're wrong about this or something, we ought to do this, and then go ahead and do that. So yeah. that, that's a thought. Uh, I get what you've asked, and that is um, we need to find a better way of um, uh, recognizing people uh, under the awards program. Uh, otherwise, there are these things now for Gary Rumler, the, uh, the Roger Kaufman Award. I, mean, I don't even know what they are anymore, to tell mm-hmm. you the truth. I, I haven't particularly cared. Uh, but it is, if I understand it right, it's more of if you decide to submit to it, then you might be considered for it. Yes. That's Some the half ass yes. way, way to do it. It seems to me that what you ought to do is look at your membership, and if you know them well enough, find out who's done whatever it is that's really deserving of getting the, uh, the Gary Rumbler Award, again, whatever that is. Uh, and I don't think we do that enough, and and obviously we don't want to do that to uh, just reward these old timers. What we want to do is, uh, however, if they've made contributions, we want reinforce that, let alone look outside of the society for people who have done things, even though they are not a part of ISB and, right. and recognize them for that. So that whole business of uh, awards, recognition, and so on, I've always felt needed a, a real refinement as far as how we go about doing it. And, and that that's a part of the, the answer to what could we change. Mm-hmm. But I, I I want to go back to the, the officer, not, both the officers and the staff, particularly the staff, needs a real orientation to who the hell these people are mm-hmm. out there and what can they do, a la what Paul Tremper used to do. Yeah. Because he knew how to keep those people engaged. It's a pretty sad story when somebody registers for the conference and they don't even know that they're the president or an ex-president of this organization. Yes. And they may not know it because they've decided to eliminate the list of 
who was, is, and I, I, I don't know if it exists anymore, but I always remember looking at the, some thing. I think it was the program. And in the back, it always had a list yes. of who previous officers and so on, currently right up to date. And that was always useful as a reminder of who the hell these people are and who mm -hmm. did what and so on. Whether they do that anymore, I have no idea. But Yeah, I don't know about that. I know that if you go to the website, uh, the list of uh, officers on the boards uh, doesn't go back more than uh, 20 years. I, it, I don't think it goes back 20 years. But... Uh, but uh, so, th but I understand that they're they're working on that right now. They're uh, getting ready for this next conference, and uh, so hopefully, uh, when they return from the, all the conference activities, that uh, they can start looking at uh, some of those things. Sure, Danny. Is there anything else that uh, you would like to uh, add about uh, your uh, professional home, if I may call it that? Well, we brought it up in the last conversation, but I. Uh, I do think it's important that the society take a good look at itself in terms of uh, what it's trying to market out there for uh, for the profession. Uh, I really have, over the years, become an advocate much more of us almost becoming the International Society for Work Improvement than a, Performance Improvement because I, I think we need to find that word or words which sing to the population we're serving, mm -hmm. and I don't think really performance does it. Uh, I am beginning to question the word technology, which I didn't question before, simply because uh, uh, the technology which we were developing, you know, again, around starting with the needs assessment and all those stages we go through, it's nice and well, but it, it's it's not particularly important anymore, certainly in terms of what I do. I, I've embedded those things into the very processes we use to get people to solve problems. And so when we have them uh, define and clarify work using a formula for it, and, and they achieve that clarity, then they are able to figure out you know where the needs are themselves because they have that capacity uh, and, and they're able to figure out solutions and help develop those solutions and so on these are this is what I'm talking about is a different way for people in our profession to do things we are no longer the the answer to their need what we are are the facilitator for uh, they're, they arriving at solution to their need and implementation and so on. And that's a whole other mind and action uh, change uh, that uh, works so much more successfully. And so we need to uh, go back and sort of challenge, uh, is this stuff that we're advocating, this performance technology, really the way to go? Or is there another way to go and and immediately I know what's going to happen when you do this it really upsets the hell out of people because performance technologists themselves do not want to change right right uh, and then the only people worse than them are the HR people <laughs> who really don't want to change so you have to kind of, you know it, it sort of reminds me of the, of the thing that went on in uh, where was it Rwanda you know, when they had all of the killings and so on, and how the people had to come and look at it differently. And, and they found a way to do that so they get reconciliation of, mm -hmm. of, of parties and, and people facing one another. Uh, I, not quite on that scale. I'm not talking about that. But it is really being able to look at this, the society, the, the technology thing, and say, are we really doing this the right way? Is there a better way to do this? And who out there has tried some other things? Let's let's invite them. Let's listen to them, inside outside of our organization, in particular, so that they can tell us. And, and and the only thing you have to watch out for are those people who have come up with some damn thing that they're using as a marketing ploy. Right. Right. You know, I mean, and there's so much of that that goes on that that you that's what you really have to be careful about. But I think it, it there is there are people who may not be known 
particularly well known or anything else that have ideas for things. Mm -hmm. We need to invite some of those people to come to ISBI and challenge us. Yeah. I don't think. We need to have people, more people from the outside coming in and uh, um, sharing with us. Um, well, thank you for agreeing to do this uh, second video with, uh, sure. with a slightly different focus than the uh, first one that we did. But uh, um, I'd like to thank you for everything that you've done for not only the society, but for the profession um, and the impact that it's had on me and uh, literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of others. Thank yeah, you, Danny. You're welcome. I appreciate that very much. It's, it's really been a, an absolute pleasure to be a part of this organization and to be able to contribute in your own kind of way. And, and, and you get back far more than I'm sure you ever give, but it's really been a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Well, have a great day. I will. All right. Bye-bye.